And I went on doing a supernovae, which makes things that provide the building glo blocks for life. But guess what? You can't have life if you don't have a planet. And this is the guy that discovers, or sometimes people hate him because he figures out that the planets other people have discovered are not real. So he's like the, the Darth Vader of the planets. <laughs> and uh, I would like to uh, introduce you to come on, Paul. Come on stage. Say hey, hi. Uh, what's about the cool things you're doing really fast before we uh, go on the lecture? Uh, sure, yeah. I am, uh, like Mono said, uh, we were PhD students together in Texas. Uh, I'm now a postdoctoral fellow at uh, Penn State University, uh, where I'm helping to develop a new instrument to, uh, as Mono said, detect planets around the stars near the sun. So we hope that we'll find planets that one day spacecraft will take a look at and we'll see evidence of some kind of life or habitable conditions. Um, but yeah, like Mono said today, we'll just talk about uh, where you get the raw materials to build those planets. So I'm, I'm hoping to learn something to myself. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so today's lecture is kind of, it's going to be uh, a lot of beautiful, pretty pictures. So brace yourselves, lay back, Imagine you're in a movie theater because there's a lot of nice structures. So the best, one of the best ways to understand supernovae uh, is to actually look at supernova remnants. It's to look at historical supernova. You know, there's, in the past, there's been a lot of explosions that actually happened in our own neighborhood, in our galactic neighborhood, in our own galaxy. So we can just go back and study what's left over hundreds and thousands of years after these explosions took place and try to figure out whether we can turn back time understand what, was the what, were, what were the conditions that led to these complex structures that we see. When we discover supernovae with our modern transient search projects, what we basically see is a bright light, a dim like point source that then becomes brighter and then dims away. But we don't really see structure. We can infer structure by doing polarimetry, which is a topic I discussed during the second lecture, but we can't really uh, see the three-dimensional structure of, the, of, the, of what's going on, unless these things are really close to us. So by looking at galactic supernovae and things that are happening in our galactic neighborhood, we can uh, learn a lot of things about the stars that produce these uh, extraordinary events. So here is a, one of my favorite lists of historical supernovae uh, that were basically, back in the ancient days, it was just the naked eye. That was your telescope. That was your instrument. So people would uh, spend a lot of time in nature. There was not a lot of light pollution. They would look at the sky all the time, and they would discover supernovae. And then they would uh, occasionally write about it. And the first one historically recorded supernova was supernova 185. Now, there's claims in the literature, and that's still an ongoing discussion, that perhaps the whole biblical story about uh, you know, uh, the three the three um, mantis going to Jesus to bring to bear gifts were actually led by a supernova star. So you know, <laughs> so, I don't you know don't take my word for it. <laughs> <laughs> but SM one eighty five. Huh? Is that SM one eighty five? Well, I will be earlier than that. So we're pretty you know accurate about the date of this one according to historical records. So the Chinese, the Europeans later, the Chinese, the Arabs. They all uh, discovered some of the first uh, supernova that happened in our galaxy. Actually, those things were so bright, because they were so close to us, that they could even observe them in the daytime. So they would look out in the daytime, and there would be a bright source of light where the supernova took place. And they would make records of these. And then, 2,000 years later, we have amazing technology, orbit-based and ground-based telescopes that allow us to to look into these things 2,000 years later in much detail. Now, what happened over the last you know, thousand, last millennium, or hundreds of years after this explosion took place, they kept expanding and diffusing around the surrounding space. So we really see extended structures at this point. They've expanded a lot by the time the, the stars exploded back, back in those days. So I'm going to go through a, uh, that list and show you some pictures. And just based on what you see from these pictures, we're going to try to understand a few. All we're going to see is the morphology of these things. 
as taken by modern telescopes across the spectrum, from the optical to the x-rays to the infrared. <coughs> and we're going to try to understand just looking at these things, what we can learn about supernova. So here is supernova 185, uh, 19, nearly 1900 uh, years after it exploded. And this is an x-ray image from the Chandra X-ray Observatory. So Chandra, as I said before, we can't, uh, we can't really observe the x-rays uh, from the ground because they get absorbed by the Earth's atmosphere. So the best way for us to understand, to, to look at the x-ray universe, to take an x-ray image of the universe, is to send out orbital telescopes that will do that. And that's technically challenging, building those telescopes. But we've gotten to the point where we have very accurate uh, uh, technology to do that. And this is an x-ray image, kind of like your chest x-ray, of the supernova remnant uh, from supernova 187. So there's two basic types of two supernova that we discussed in lecture two. There's type one A's that are basically explosions of white dwarfs. And then there's a core collapse supernova, the arm core collapse of massive stars. Now, some of them leave remnants. If you remember, one of the main differences between the two is that the type 1A supernovae leave no remnants behind. Well, uh, while uh, core collapse supernova would either leave a, a black hole or a neutron star behind after the explosion. So the first thing you look at when you look at the supernova remnant, you try to zoom into the center as much as possible, see is there anything there? And in this case, there is nothing uh, that you see. And we also look at the morphology. Look at this structure right here. And this structure right here. There's, it's this bow like structure, this bright blue color here, indicates where the actual supernova shock is right now. So, over the last 1900 years, the supernova shock blew the star out and kept traveling the surrounding space, piling up material. And this is where it is right now. And th those shocks are very bright in the x rays. Those blast waves are very bright in the x rays. So X-ray imaging is the best way to detect and study the morphology of these shocks. And the other thing that is evident just by looking at this picture is that it's not spherical. And I kept coming back to this over and over again. Stars are not really perfectly spherical. And the non-asphericity is manifested uh, in the structure of this supernova remnant. Now, there's two ways that this non-spherical structure came to be. It either had to be that the star was intrinsically a spherical and it exploded in a spherical way, or it had to be that there's material around the star that exploded that's not uniformly distributed around the star. And eventually, the supernova shock interacts a different way with non-uniformly distributed material that's here and here. So that, that's also another factor that plays a role. But we can keep going down the list and looking at uh, supernova 386. Now for this one, if we take an X-ray image, we see a very bright X-ray uh, source in the center. <coughs> that turns out to be a, a pulsar, highly magnetized pulsar, that rotates at a really high rate, uh, producing uh, bright X-ray uh, emission. And what you see here, that's also a very interesting feature, it's, uh, it's a jet lag feature. So what's going on there? You know, uh, that gives us a lot of information about the central engine that could have powered the explosion in this case. You know, most of the explosions I've said are powered by the radioactive case of nickel and cobalt, but there's a few explosions that are powered that could be powered by the rapid spin down of a, of a neutron star that's born right after the explosion in the core of the, of the star, the outer core of the star. And this is what we see here. We see a highly magnetized pulsar produce really bright X-ray emission. And that emission, guess what? It's actually going to heat up the surrounding supernova jet. So that one left a remnant behind. Therefore, we can safely assume that it wasn't a type 1A supernova. It was a, very likely a core collapse. Now this one is uh, some of type 1A supernova people's favorite supernova remnant. It's pretty round. I mean, it's, you know, there's asphericities. But in general, it's more round than other events we've seen. And if you remember, one other characteristic between type 1A and core collapse supernova is that type 1A tend to be rounder, still not perfectly spherical, but rounder than core collapse supernova. 
because they come, uh, they come from the explosion of a compact white dwarf star, which is pretty uniform. And in many cases, the environment around the, the star is clean. And they get more or less a spherical shape. So, and it, on top of that, if you look in the center of this remnant, you will find nothing, which is yet another indicator that this was a type 1 astronomical explosion. Now, people have been spending a lot of time to look for something else that would nail, um, put the nail in the coffin about this being a type 1A. And that would be a companion star. Because if you remember, the way to get a type 1A supernova is to transfer mass from a companion star onto the white dwarf, grow it to this critical mass that will cause it to explode. So where is that, that um, companion star here? We haven't found it yet. And that has stirred a lot of controversy in the type 1A community, where the two competing models have been the white dwarf merger versus the mass transfer from a massive star model, the double and the single uh, degenerate model. So the double degenerate people come here to say to us, well, single degenerate guys, you're wrong. There's nothing we see. There's no evidence of a companion star. Therefore, it's more likely that this was caused by a, uh, two white dwarfs merging together. Well, the, the single degenerate people fire back and say, well, you know, companion stars can be hard to find because sometimes they can be very dim. So our telescopes, you know, they basically just kick the can down the street. They say, well, our telescopes are not strong enough to find this. So that's why we haven't found it yet. So, and the battle goes on and on and on. Uh, <clears throat> this is supernova 80, uh, 1181. It also shows evidence of a pulsar in the center. As a matter of fact, we see a, a double uh, featured uh, structure. We see uh, jets coming out of the neutron star, but we also see a toroidal structure around it. You know? And that also is evidence that this star was not a type 1 supernova. It was very likely a core collapse event. And it was very, very spherical. And there had to be a lot of rotation involved in this explosion because a, the pulsar that you detect in the center is really rapidly rotating itself. And B, it has formed a disk, a fallback disk around it, which is evidence of something accreting in high degree of rotation. So that's the star that died producing this event was very likely highly rotated. Um, now, there's an image missing here. But um, this is one of my personal favorites, it's the Crab Nebula. It's a clear indication of a, a pulsar, a very well-studied pulsar in the center of this Crab Nebula. But one of the most spectacular things about this image is this amazing filamentary structure <clears throat> that you see voids and filaments and areas of higher density, areas of lower density. Um, and that gives you, that makes you, even just looking at this image starts makes you want to think about what's going on. Why is the structure like that? What, what did the star look like producing this thing? And that goes back that stars are not spirit. The last few moments of a massive star's life are everything but quiet. Stars have strong convective currents that I've showed you in simulations before that will deform the internal structure of the star in a way that after it, ex after it explodes, it will exacerbate, it will exaggerate those features. And what would you see here, basically, is the leftover remnants of this internal structure as the supernova ejecta expands and you start going <coughs> deeper and deeper into the, the ashes of the star that exploded. You, all you see is basically the, uh, what's left over from this structure. And this is, not a, this is not a spherical structure at all. As a matter of fact, uh, areas where, uh, which are bright in yellow, are areas where a lot of x-rays are produced as well in this image. And those high energy areas means that you have material that is very dense, that's emitting in the x-rays, and this is reheated by the pulsar in the center of the craft nebula all the time, continuously. And this is a very rapid pulsar, it's a three, three, 33 millisecond pulsar. That means that it takes about one third of a second for the, uh, for the pulsar to rotate on itself. So imagine, I take something the size of Chicago, 
and you know have it rotate around itself in such a fast time. It's really rapidly rotated uh, multi-neutral stars. Now those we owe a lot of supernova discoveries and uh, studies to these guys. Uh, this is Tycho, and this is uh, uh, his master, his professor, his mentor, Kepler. This is kind of a nice portrait because it's the only portrait that I find in the literature where they two are together in the same image. Uh, and we all, uh, the discovery of two important supernova renders this gentleman, the Kepler and the Tycho supernova. Uh, this is supernova 1572. <clears throat> and you can see here uh, that it's also, uh, this is an x-ray image as well, and you can see all the uh, x-ray emission coming out from, uh, from the shock that's located at this distance right now from, uh, from, the, from the side of the explosion. And this Which is super question. Can yes. you turn the uh, ceiling lights down a little bit? Yeah, sure. Yes. Got the magic button over there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it better? Yeah. Oh, nice. yeah, thanks. <laughs> so we have uh, supernova 1006 as well, which is pretty round. No evidence for a neutron star or remnant in the center. Pretty confident that this was a type 1 supernova explosion as well. But again, <clears throat> look at this material right here. Even in the case of a white dwarf exploding, you have this three inherently three-dimensional structure that affects the properties of the explosion. And you can learn a lot about the star that exploded by just studying the details of this structure. And the why it's denser here, less than there. Why it's hotter here than there. And you can make simulations. That's the tool we have, the best tool we have to study these events, three-dimensional three numerical simulations. And the whole point we're trying to do this is try to reproduce this structure. And there's beautiful uh, animations and simulations that we have done here at the Flash Center at the University of Chicago that show structure that's reminiscent of what we see in these events, like pointing to the fact that we are in the right direction and trying to understand what's going on. And this is the supernova that Kepler discovered in 1604. And uh, this is a composite image that's taken by a variety of uh, telescopes. So we have an image of the X-rays from Chandra. We have optical images from Hubble, and we have infrared images from the Spitzer Telescope, also another great orbital facility launched by NASA. So in different colors, we came different compositions because different materials <coughs> emit light in different frequencies. And that's one of the main tools we use in astrophysics to figure out the composition of things. Uh, some materials will be bright, especially the radioactive materials, will be bright in the, in the x-rays. Whereas materials like hydrogen and helium will be brighter in the, in the optical emission. So by making a composite image, by taking images across the spectrum and combining them together, we can immediately form a three-dimensional image of the compositional structure of supernova remnants and, and be able to say, hey, this is where hydrogen is, this is where helium is, this is where oxygen and silicon might be. And by doing that, we unveil something very interesting hints about the onion structure of massive stars that I talked about in the first lecture. As a, as a massive star lives its life, all it's doing is exhausting its fuel, which starts from being hydrogen, using hydrogen to helium, helium to higher elements, carbon, oxygen, silicon, and eventually iron. And if you look at the compositional structure of things like that, you will see that hydrogen ten tends to be in the outer areas, whereas <coughs> heavy elements tend to be in the more centrally located areas. And radioactive material is in, and iron is in the center. So that gives you hints about the actual three-dimensional structure of the star that exploded, which confirms our theories about what are these stars made of and what the composition of the massive stars are. And in this particular one, we do believe that this particular one is probably a, a core collapse supernova, but we haven't yet seen a neutron star. Now, that doesn't mean that all core collapse supernova will produce neutron stars because the massive ones will most likely produce black holes and we will not be able to see the black holes. So, people are discussing that perhaps maybe there is a black hole that was formed there. Still, you have no evidence for that, however. <clears throat> this is Cassiopeia A, another very well studied galactic supernova remnant. And this is again, Chandra has provided a lot of, a lot of interesting information in the x-rays about the structure of these things. 
Now, I want you to take a moment and just embrace the structure. It's so beautiful. Uh, it's just filaments, and bubbles, and all kinds of blobs. And if you if you look carefully, you will see that there is a a gentle flow in a preferential direction, a jet. You can see very different images, but if you look closely, you will see evidences for a jet. And that goes back to the fact that there, there could be explosions out there that do not explode symmetrically. They explode in the form of by jets, jet-induced supernova explosions. And we think that this might be one example of a, of a jet-induced supernova explosion where two energetic jets just blew the <coughs> apart and we can see what's left over. A jet and a carbon jet. At the same time, we can see the X-ray emission from the shock of the supernova that has expanded. And also X-ray emission from the, <coughs> from the central object, as well as uh, the radioactive material that slowly became hitting the, hitting the uh, supernova. And there's the jet, and this is the counter jet. And this is the compact remnant in the center, a neutral star. That is a very well studied event, and every time people are asking for allocation in big telescopes, uh, in, in my field, they're always going to look at CASE. Because we're still trying to make, right now, there's people that have spent the majority of their careers building three dimensional models <coughs> of Cassiopeia. <laughs> because what you see here is a projection in a two dimensional image. But by doing this, by looking at this uh, object in different wavelengths, you can actually start seeing three-dimensional structure. You can infer this three-dimensional structure. And by doing that, people have built beautiful three-dimensional mo models of how this looks from all directions, <laughs> and where different materials concentrate. Uh, and this is, uh, again, Cassiopeia in, uh, in the x-rays. This shows you this jet feature better than the previous image, because uh, it turns out that this jet feature has a lot of silicon material in it. So when the star blew up, the silicon layer that was surrounding the iron core was uh, ex exploded in the two different directions by the jet. And what you see here is a mission from the silicon uh, in the blue image on the right. That helps us understand the jets better. This is one of the latest ones that uh, exploded in our Milky Way, about 140 years old. Uh, and it was really close to the center of our Milky Way. Remember, uh, if, you want to look, if you look at the structure of a galaxy, you will look at, in our galaxy, it's a, it's a giant spiral galaxy. But if you look at job through the spiral, there will be a lot of obs obscurity and also absorption by dust. And this happens to be really close to the plane of the galaxy. And it's a really tough business to try to study this. The, this object because a lot of the light that's producing has been absorbed by interfering dust between us and, and that object. Uh, so what we can do, however, we can trick. We can trick it and just look at it in the x-rays because dust does not emit in the x-rays. But if you look at it in the optical, in the infrared, you're going to have a lot of trouble. In the x-rays, the, the there's more structure to be seen. But this is the breakthrough discovery right now. And this is the I would say the topic of today's <coughs> lecture. And uh, supernova astrophysicist's fa favorite uh, event. I was one years old when that happened, in 1987. And it exploded in a nearby satellite galaxy, the Large Magellanic Cloud. The Large Magellanic Cloud is uh, about 200,000 light years away, which means that the light we see from this supernova took about 100,000 years to get to us. But the fact that it was so close, allowed us to follow every single day of the evolution of this explosion and understand in detail what was the star that exploded, how it exploded, what kind of emission it produced, and what was the environment around it. This is very important. Turns out that this exploded in a sort of like dirty environment and interacted with it later on. And this is how it looks like uh, it looked like in 2003. Uh, 16 years after the explosion. And what you're going to see is a blue structure in the center that kind of looks like a cigar. It's an elongated structure. Basically, people think this is jets left over after the explosion of the star. But then you're going to see these blobs around it. Some, in some blobs, you see more light than others. 
And it turns out that over time, those blobs became brighter and brighter. So what was going on? But very likely that the star that exploded eventually caught up with the surrounding environment and started interacting with it. So the shock from the explosion brought the supernova material to these blobs and they, they impacted together. And that created a lot of X-ray emission that we can see in optical emission. We believe that it made a neutron star, but we haven't found it yet. And now I'm going to go through a series of very historic pictures uh, that they go back to the discovery of supernova 1978. So, as I said, this is kind of like an image of our galactic neighborhood. Obviously, we didn't, nobody took this picture of our galaxy. <laughs> <laughs> so we put a picture of a similar galaxy in this frame just to, to give a context of where things are, and where other galaxies are in our galactic neighborhood. So we have our galaxy, and we have a large Magellanic and a small Magellanic cloud, which are satellite small dwarf galaxies, irregular galaxies that um, rotate around our galaxy. They're about 107,000 light years away. And then the next nearest big galaxy is the Andromeda galaxy, it's about 2 million light years away. There's a few other messier uh, NGC objects. But this supernova took place here. It's the closest one, the closest core collapse event that we've discovered. And this is another close up image of the Large Magellanic Cloud, which shows you that it's a regular galaxy. It doesn't really have a sp spiral structure like our galaxy or an elliptical, and more symmetric st structure that we see in other galaxies. Uh, it's a dwarf galaxy, it's low luminosity. And this is yet another image of it. And now we're going to go through the, the first birth pictures of supernova 1987. This is how the, uh, this area of the sky, this is how the Rats Magellanic Cloud looked like one day before the explosion. So it's kind of like a diffuse cloud. It looks like a diffuse cloud, but you see nothing. A few concentrations of stars and a lot of foreground stars in our galaxy. Nothing has happened yet. And these are pictures, I have to emphasize, taken by, uh, in, the, in, the, in the southern hemisphere because the LMC is visible from the south, from Australia, for example. We, can, we couldn't see that in that in the United States or Europe. Uh, and then one day later, Something started to become bright. I'm going to do this. This is what we keep finding when we look for supernova. I want you to look at this right here. I wasn't there before. Bang, bang, bang. <laughs> and uh, actually, an amateur astronomer in Australia, that's why we love amateur astronomers, because you know we're too busy sometimes sitting in our computers and uh, doing our own thing. But these people actually spend a lot of time looking at the sky. More time than we do sometimes, and they're very passionate about it. And they have amateur astronomers have found a lot of supernova explosions, and usually the first to report it. Citizen science is very important. Citizens get together, united by a passion about the sky. They invest a lot of money and time to buy equipment and just stare at the sky for nights, over nights, over nights, and that pays off. And they don't get enough credit sometimes. So I like to give credit to the amateur astronomers for. Uh, <clears throat> providing all these beautiful uh, discoveries for us to discover, to, discover, to, to study in more detail with more expensive uh, equipment. Uh, and then I'm just going to go through the first few pictures. So it exploded. This is the first known for photograph of 9878, just a few hours after the shock breakout. Mm -hmm. Now that goes back to the, to the fact that when you look at the evolution of life from the supernova, as I said last time, there's two distinct features in the light curve. The intensity of light as a function of time. Initially, if you're lucky enough and you capture this explosion early on, you will see a the shock breakout emission. You see a very bright burst that lasts only one or two days. So that's why you have to be lucky to catch it. Right now we can because we have more sophisticated, automated robotic telescopes that do this for us. But once you catch it, it will start, once it goes bright, it will slowly sl start dimming and dimming dim until Radioactivity kicks in, nickel and cobalt 56 formed by the explosion in the core of the star. That's going to start reheating the supernova ejector. And then it's going to go back up. And then eventually, radioactivity, as the supernova expands, it cools, and uh, there's less and less radioactivity. It decays, and eventually it dims down. So, this picture right here is just a few hours after shock breakout. We actually caught this supernova, you know. 
we saw the shock, we effectively saw the shock breaking the star apart. The first few hours, really early on. And this is how it looked one day later. And this is near maximum light, so now this is about one or two weeks after the shock breakout when radioactivity kicked in and started reheating the supernova. So this is the secondary peak in the, in the evolution of the light. And, and then people were like, okay, we have a lot of pre-explosion images. Of, people have been collecting high accuracy images of the sky over the years. So what if we go back to those archives and we look at the location of where Supernova 1987A took place and see if we can discover the progenitor star? Can we find, can we see the star that exploded? It shouldn't be there anymore. It's there. So by comparing post-explosion images to pre-explosion images, you hope to see what star produced the explosion. And people now have done this for, uh, for a couple of dozen of uh, supernova explosions. They went back and they actually saw the star that exploded. That's not there anymore. And that confirms a lot of our theories, because we see things exploding and we think they're massive stars. And yet, yes, you go back and you see, yeah, that was a 15 solar mass star that exploded. That was a 12 solar mass star that exploded. A 20 solar mass star that exploded. So they're always massive uh, in this case. So <coughs> this is a close-up of the region of stars, of the region where supernova 98 exploded. And this is a star that's not there anymore. And there's another uh, blue supergiant star. It was, it was a blue supergiant star. There was another uh, dimmer star, which is about uh, a few light years away from this one. And there is a very dim third star, which you can't really see in this image. There's actually two stars here. There's one dim one right down there. And that star is not there anymore. And we know how big it is. It was a blue supergiant. It was uh, about 12 solar masses. And that produced supernova 97A. But we went way after the bank, way after the light has dimmed, the main you know, supernova light curve has dimmed down, and using our Hubble Space Telescope, which was the best telescope we have at the time, we've been looking in detail what's left over from this explosion. And you see this interesting structure here. Those are, those are the stars that, that basically I showed you before. It's, it's zoomed in, so you see the, the neighboring stars. And then you see these rings, and you see this torus in the center, and this elongated bright spot. Um, so we started looking at the structure of the internal structure of the star that exploded when using, when using this event. So, and way later on, as I said, supernova 97A started interacting with surrounding material and started lighting up those blobs. And I'm going to show you a, a movie that people have collected over the last uh, tens of years or so that shows the evolution of, of Supernova 97A. I think that's next. So, if it cooperates, that well. This is the central star that exploded. James gets this elongated structure. Look at this, getting brighter and brighter over time. This is a movie of a supernova, a live movie of a supernova. <laughs> the only one. <laughs> what time period? I'm sorry? How long is the time period? The time period is uh, until last year, from 1987 until last year, basically. So, so that's last year, last year. Yeah. I'm sorry? The last slide was last year? Yeah, the last slide was last year. So I'll, show, I'll play for you again here. So the ejecta pile up this matter, interact with the surrounding sequence stellar material, and it gets brighter and brighter over time. Eventually, down the road, when the interaction ceases, this will start dimming out, and the, the whole structure is just going to expand. But simultaneously, as this happens, the internal structure, the central structure, expands as well. And it doesn't expand in a spherical way, because supernovae are not perfectly spherical. And there, there was a jet potentially involved in this explosion. That's, that's what the structure hints to us. Now, the most amazing thing about Supernova 1987A, besides the fact, because of the fact it was so close to us, it was that it was the only supernova for which we actually detected neutrinos 
we're really excited to get seven neutrinos in a 10 second burst <laughs> from this supernova explosion. And that's a lot for saying how hard it is to detect neutrinos. Um, so, people have spent a lot of money to build neutrino detectors um, uh, underground in Japan, in the United States, in Europe. And all that for seven neutrinos for supernova. I mean, okay, they, they look at neutrinos from other sources too, but we just care about supernovae. And that confirmed our idea that that was a core collapse event. Because if you remember, most of the energy carried in a core collapse explosion is carried by the neutrinos. These this particles, these uh, ghost particles that don't interact strongly with, with matter. And that's why they're so hard to detect. 10 to the 53 ergs of energy, which is the unit we use to measure energy in astrophysics, are produced in a core collapse event. And only 1% of these neutrinos is captured by the explosion, aids the explosion to become successful and to blow up the star successfully. 99% of these, it just flows freely through the stellar matter without interacting with it. And this is the first signal, signal that comes out of the explosion after iron core collapse. The first signal. So this signal was detected before the actual optical signal. The neutrinos left the matter, we caught them in the Earth, seven neutrinos from the source that turned out to be supernova 97. Yes. How do you know those neutrinos came from the supernova and not someplace else? Well, because we could localize the source uh, from the detectors, we were able to, to point the direction from where they came from. And that direction coincided with the location of supernova 97. And the timing also made, made sense. Because we got this event very early on, so we were able to look at the, the breakout light curve and within very high accuracy, we knew when exactly the supernova exploded. So timing and space was coincident. So we're pretty sure that that was a supernova 97. And this is how it looks like over the years. This is, if you, if you just measure the light from supernova 97, the intensity of light or luminosity over the years, this is what it looks like right now. So this is the initial burst, shock breakout that I talked about. The first picture that I showed you, the first optical image that I showed you, which lasts only a few hours, and days, and, and then as the supernova, as the supernova material started to expand, it started to cool down. And this is the cooling down phase. But before it cooled down all the way, radioactivity kicked in and said, hey, where are you going? I'm going to heat you up a little more. And that's what you get for the next three months. It's this rebrightening, this peak uh, caused by the radioactive decay of nickel and cobalt. And then Obviously, that's also going to decay over time. Right now, we have followed these decay lines all the way uh, to dimmer luminosities, and we measure what the rate of light decay is. And it, by doing that, by, by measuring how fast, how rapidly the light decays at late times, we can figure out what radioactive material is providing the, uh, the luminosity, what radioactive material is decaying. Early on, it's cobalt and nickel and iron, but we've, we're to the point right now where we see titanium uh, decay for this supernova uh, later on. And that's what powers the light right now. That's what mainly powers the, or heats the diffuse now supernova ejectors, titanium decay, plus the circumstantial interaction that happened with the surrounding material. Uh, question? Yes? The seven neutrinos you say that Earth detected. Yeah. took place in that all the way at the end of the... Here! <laughs> now, is it's not even on the map. Yes. Is the neutrino um, emission in any way related to the luminosity? I mean, you would think that we would get more from you. Well, <clears throat> the neutrino emission is not related to the luminosity. It's basically related to the content of how massive the iron core that collapsed is. Because the more iron atoms you have, the more neutrinos you can produce once the uh, explosion takes place. So it's really, it's really a function of mass, a progenitor mass in a way. So it was very bright. They produced 10 to the 57 neutrinos in the explosion. That's a large number. And we got seven. And we got seven. Yeah. That's funky great. But we're really happy about that. Um, and then the question is, what's left behind? We don't see evidence for any remnant of supernova 97A. We have looked at the pre-explosion pictures. We have confirmed, based on the characteristics and the properties of this explosion, that it was a core collapse event. It wasn't a type 1A supernova. 
We're 100% sure of that. It was a massive star that exploded. But yet, we don't see any remnant left over. And the reason is, there's definitely no neutron star that we see. But perhaps there's a black hole. So there's a lot of controversy right now. There's a lot of discussion in the community about what's left over for supernova s 7 We still see nothing. And people are trying to see circumstantial evidence or uh, infer the existence of a neutron star or a black hole. <coughs> and we still don't know what's left over. Uh, and people are still fighting about that. <coughs> I apologize for my voice. How many a friend this from out of town after one year, you know, gets to a late night? <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's still a it's still a project of it's still under discussion to understand what is going on in the center of supernova and seven eight. Now it was a jet of explosion. We see jets. We see those features that are uh, asymmetric, and the way to produce these features is rotation magnetic fields. Therefore, uh, people say, well, to produce a jet, you know, you very likely have to have a neutron star. Very rapidly rotating, spinning down the neutron star. Uh, but then people are like, okay, where is it? Why don't I see it? So, still a conversation. Now, sometimes we get lucky in astrophysics. And uh, it's kind of like winning the lottery, really. This person, Alicia Soderberg, is an astronomer that uh, I know her personally, she's a professor at Harvard that discovered the supernova uh, 2008B. Well, she wasn't even looking for it. <laughs> she was just looking at this field of view, this, this portion of the sky, an older supernova, this one, 2007UY. Uh, and as she was looking for it, bam, the second one took place in the same galaxy. What's the likelihood of that? <laughs> Buy me a lottery ticket. <laughs> Seriously. And uh, she discovered that uh, supernova really early on. So we were able to start the shock breakout from supernova 8D. We, we had a light of kind of like the one for supernova 87A, the whole thing. Usually, I want to emphasize on that, usually when we discover supernova, we just see that part, you know, because that's the one that lasts more. So we like to, when we catch this early on. Now we can do it better because of the automated techniques we have. But back in those days, it wasn't easy. So it wasn't easy back then, she found it. And we have very detailed follow-up of the supernova across the, the entire spectrum, from the optical to the x-rays to the infrared. And we're also very sure that this is a core collapse event. This is yet another massive star that exploded. <coughs> and, and particularly a type 1 B or C, because we don't see hydrogen in this, in this one. And that means that <coughs> somehow <coughs> the progenitor of this star lost its hydrogen envelope. Be it mass transfer, be it mass loss, we don't know, but there was no hydrogen there. So there was a lot of helium, but no hydrogen. Now, those very strong supernova shock breakout flashes are accompanied, are accompanied by a burst in the X-ray. So we know that when we see them, that if we look at them in the X-rays, we're going to get a lot of information about what? About the the physical size of the progenitor star. So the duration, the characteristic duration that this burst lasted will give us an idea how big the star was. So it turns out that in the case of supernova 97A, it was a compact blue super, super giant, which means that uh, the, the radius of the star was not as big as the radii of most stars that make supernova, which are red super giants. It's more compact by, by, by an order of 100 or so. Uh, a billion kilometers is the answer. And, and for this one, we also got the similar answer. That was also a very blue compact star that exploded, uh, which is hints to the fact that, hey, there's no hydrogen. These stars are more compact. It makes sense that some, you know, the, the, the evidence comes together that something removes hydrogen from a, for a more massive extended star. And, creates a more compact star with this explosion uh, that we observe right here. So that all, that puzzle comes, comes together very well about the progenitors of Corpola supernova across different uh, uh, compositions, hydrogen, helium, and so on and so forth. So to summarize, over the last 2,000 uh, years, cultures around the Earth we're looking at the skies and they discovered a lot of uh, interesting historical supernova that we can go back to today, study their structure and infer what's called the three dimensional 
characteristics and the properties of the star that exploded producing this event. And uh, we can turn back time, we can just press the reverse button trying to figure out how this came to be there. And the hints, the main hints we get about just looking at the three dimensional structures of supernovae is that stars are not perfectly spherical, that the few last moments before a star dies are very violent. The star undergoes a lot of uh, cyclonic motions and convection that deforms the star from us recently. Some of them are not even exploding in a spherical way. They're exploding via jets. And we see evidence of that in the post-explosion images. Some of them leave uh, remnants behind. Like we, we can actually see the remnant. We see the neutron star in some of them. Some of them, we don't find evidence of remnant. Some of them make black holes. And it's a challenge for us to try to figure out and discover what's left behind. But it's also a very important conversation to have because that will sort out a lot of controversy about the progenitors or type 1H, for example. Where is, the, where is the companion star? And by looking at these supernova remnants, we can infer a lot of information that can help us towards this direction. Uh, <clears throat> so by looking at galactic supernova remnants, uh, we learn a lot about the performance of the star that exploded. Uh, and uh, supernova 97A was one of the most pivotal discoveries in the supernova community because that's the only core collapse supernova event for which we, we detect in neutrinos. And uh, we have been following up in detail over the years from the neutrino emission all the way down to titanium 44 decay. And we figured out it was a blue super giant star that exploded. It wasn't, spheric, it wasn't a spherical explosion. There was jets involved. The environment around the star that exploded is very not clean. There is material that the supernova jet interacted with. And most supernova are like that. Nature is complicated. We like to sit down in our computers and make one dimensional models, assuming spherical symmetry, because that's convenient and that's easy and cheap to do. But in reality, there's things around stars. The star itself is going to, the last few years of its life, it's going to lose a lot of mass violently by episodic mass loss events. But that mass is not just going to disappear, it's going to be around it when the supernova is going to explode. And the supernova is going to interact with this mass. It's going to change the properties of the emission and the way that it looks. And that's why we see this zoo, this zoology, astrozoology of supernova types and properties. Because they're complicated, inherently three dimensional, and they are surrounded by very, very complicated, geomet geometrically complicated material that they interact with eventually. So I just want to leave you with that note. And, um, Urge you to go out outside of Chicago and look at the sky and find us some more supernova. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, Thanksgiving is two weeks away. I thought there was a lecture next week. Uh, well, next week there is another event that's taking place uh, that, in, you know, in the time of my lecture, so. There's not going to be a lecture. It's, it's another event that I think you're only invited to. It's another cosmic origins kind of uh, lecture event, uh, cosmological uh, yeah, talk or something like that. So December, uh, December, uh, <coughs> December seven is going to be the next one. December one more, one more. There's two more. You. There's yeah. two more lectures. Yeah. You have two. I have two more lectures. Yeah. What's next week? Is it like? Fermi Institute type things too? Yeah, they have some cosmology talking about Fermi Institute. And then there's Thanksgiving, and then after that is my next lecture. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be the big one. Yes. Yes. And your picture of Stars, there's a lot of background stars, but they're different distance, so they're not actually part oh, so of So it's, it's foreground stars yes. that are really Yes, yeah, exactly. It's just in the field of view. Yes, sir. Can you help me understand in 1988 why the neutrino source arrived before the light? Well, because neutrinos don't interact. So for light, to be able to see optical light and optical emissions with supernovae, 
Light needs to diffuse out the mass and escape free stream outside the star. That only happens when the shock that explodes the star gets to the surface of the star. And that takes time. You know, the explosion is initiated in the center at the collapse of the iron core. And when that happens, you can form a shock that travels outwards in the stellar mass. And that takes a few days to get there. So before it gets there, you can't see light. There's no light escaping the star. Once it gets there and blows the star up, you start seeing the burst. But neutrinos don't interact with them. But it's just free stream through the stellar mass. Thank you. Next. Yes, sir. Uh, do you ever detect uh, gravitational waves from supernova explosions? That is a very good question. Uh, so we haven't yet, but we believe that uh, massive core collapse supernova explosions should have a gravitational wave signal because what happens is when you have the super when you have the col collapse of the iron core to form a pulsar or a neutron star, because of the fact that the explosion is not spherically symmetric it's going to give a kickback to the neutron star. So it's going to explode, but then the neutron star is not going to stay at the center. It's going to get slight kickback velocity. It's going to be kicked to a certain direction. That's another evidence for a, a spherical collapse. And when that happens, when you have such a massive, dense, compact object getting a kick that moves through space and time, that will create a ripple in space and time. It will create, it will create a gravitational wave signal now those are going to be really hard to detect because they're weaker than other sources. And the stronger, the strongest sources of gravitational waves are, you know, uh, systems of neutron stars, or neutron star, or black hole. But uh, this one is going to be weaker, so it's going to be a challenge to detect. But it's going to be there. We expect, we expect it's going to be there. Yeah. Yes. How do you detect uh, gravi gravitational? Well, that is, <laughs> that is very, very uh, delicate technology. Uh, you have detectors that are separated by thousands of miles of each other. And usually they're in the form of a triangle. You know, there's one here, one here, one there. And all you try to do is just detect slight movements or slight uh, uh, oscillations in very, 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 very delicate uh, uh, so I, I can't, I, I'm not an expert in this, so I can't really tell you in detail, but all, all it is, it's, it's finding very, very fine motion that moves in a certain way, a transverse way, it oscillates in a certain way, that's characteristic to the amplitude of the gravitational wave. And that's very expensive to build, it's not technically easy. Yes? If I had the anachronism wrong, but you can go on Google, I think it's legal, L -L yeah. yeah, Large Interferometer Gravitational yeah. Observatory. <coughs> yeah, that would be a good idea, yeah. Google that. Yes. There are uh, three masses, there are, uh, the three types of neutrinos have different masses, uh, or they change mass as they move. How does that affect the transmission of the neutrinos toward us? Okay. Question about quantum chromodynamics. Uh, well, neutrinos come with, as, as you correctly pointed out, in uh, three main flavors. Uh, electron neutrinos, muon neutrinos, and power neutrinos. And neutrino neutrino interactions are extremely uh, difficult and nonlinear. Uh, people in the accelerators and uh, particle physicists are trying to understand nonlinear neutrino interactions for years now, and we, we do have an idea of what's going on, but we're still trying to figure out what they're in. Why would the neutrinos of a certain flavor preferentially make that flavor over that flavor? That, that, all, that doesn't always happen in a predetermined way. You know, there's not a unique answer to that. There's algorithm that we do. There's statistical methods we use to, to be able to say what's the probability that a neutrino is going to transition to a certain flavor versus another flavor. But it turns out that neutrino flavors are important in the core collapse supernova, and people are realizing that, that over the last five, six years, and while they're building those three-dimensional models of core collapse, and they're putting the neutrino physics in, now they start to account for the fact that there's three flavors. That wasn't the case before. Before it was all about, okay, how much energy is an electron neutrino, which is the most common one, going to deposit in the expanding material? But that, it's a fine-tuning problem. And by taking into consideration the quantum chromodynamics aspect of it, which is very hard and very nonlinear, makes some uh, makes some qualitative differences. Yeah. yeah. Um, <coughs> let me for a second. Um, 
I'm happy to say that uh, uh, the supernova in the galaxy M51, the Whirlpool, the so-called um, April Fool one of 1994, uh, was discovered using a telescope that I helped make. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but there's a danger here, and this danger is going to be uh, kind of underscored uh, uh, this coming Monday. Um, uh, many of you may, may already know that um, uh, nocturnal reconnaissance uh, satellites have just have noted that Chicago is the brightest lit spot on Earth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it no kidding, it is. How does Vegas, New York, everything? Um, and the brightest, very brightest spot, by the way, is Navy Pier. <laughs> in any case, though, uh, there's danger because the the city is thinking of making the city actually five times brighter than it already is. Oh, this is going to make it very difficult to yeah. see M51. You know, yeah. like it's going to be very, very You're difficult. You're going to have to drive like two hours. Um, I'd like to tell people that, you know, maybe there's something we can do about this. This is really crazy. It isn't just astronomy losing out. I like it's our astronomy activism. It's our healthy losing out. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If you Google circadian rhythm and blue light, yeah. you can see the there's a connection, there's a health connection here. Your your melatonin is not activated correctly because blue light is your guy, right? Yeah. The melatonin doesn't doesn't happen. Well, you don't see the blue light, guess what? But they're going to change to these blue LEDs. And um, we've got to stop this. This is crazy. How do we stop it? Maybe maybe call your alderman or something. Do something about this. This this is by, the way, by the way, uh, you can see my name uh, if you look in the Chicago Tribune, um, the weather page on the lower right corner. There's what's called a title watch. I know the right. Call your own. Call somebody. Get on City Hall. Just found bars up. Thank you for raising the word. Yes, yes ma'am. Well, uh, one of the main things that I, I hope that people would walk out with uh, in these lectures is to know what a massive star is, the difference between massive stars, to know what stars, what, what are supernova, what stars produce supernova, the general context of what makes these bright explosions, why are they important? But there's two main reasons why are they being important. They're important, A, because they're so bright that we can see them really far away distances, and we can infer what's going on at the universe at scales that we wouldn't imagine, we wouldn't be able to do it otherwise. Just because they're so bright, we can see them billions of light years away. And the furthest objects are in the universe, the furthest you look in the past. So we can infer information about the young universe by studying supernovae. That's one why they're important. And the other one is they form the building blocks of life. They form uh, the stars synthesize silicon, carbon, oxygen, iron. That's in our blood, that's in our watches, in our iPhones, in our homes. And this, you need this building. In, in, initially, that wasn't there. It was just hydrogen and helium. So you needed massive stars to build it. And then you need supernova from massive stars to explode and enrich space with this material that can then be harvested by planets, or make planets that can sustain life. So I, I just hope that you're going to walk out from this lecture series knowing why supernova are important, why we study them, why we care, the main different types of them, and how challenging, technically, it is to discover them, and how far we've gone into understanding, inferring uh, very valuable information about stars and stellar death just by looking at light, and just by deciphering the information we have from light, by spectra, looking across across the entire spectrum, and the wealth of information that we can understand. I hope that's what you're going to work on. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yes, I would like to know how many black holes are created by exploding stars? Well, we have a percentage. that is a, so <clears throat> out of all stars, there's only 5% uh, that are massive. Massive stars are the majority of stars out there. The more you go up in mass, the rarer 
the, the smaller the numbers get. That means that out of everything you see in the sky, 5% are going to be supernova. Now, out of these 5%, not all of them are going to make uh, black holes. A lot of them are going to make neutron stars. So there's probably like 1% to 2% of massive stars, and they tend to be the most massive of massive, <laughs> that will produce black holes. Although that's also, right now, uh, the question you're asking uh, came up very recently uh, in the community because it turns out that stellar death is quite chaotic. Uh, we used to think back in the day that the, the more you go up in mass, you know, you're going to transition from making neutron stars to black holes you know, in a very smooth way. Well, it turns out that there is islands of mass, of, of progenitor mass, for which you can make black holes where you wouldn't expect them. You would expect a neutron star. So we say at 11 solar masses, at 11 times the mass of the star, you can have a supernova producing a black hole, uh, a neutron star, but then at 11.01 solar masses, you could have one producing a black hole. Because over the last few years of massive star stellar evolution, things become very sensitive to the initial conditions. The initial conditions don't matter anymore because we have these chaotic motions that disturb the star, the progress of the star, and that can induce, uh, make a qualitative difference in the explosion of the star. So that's now a very open question. Now you're asking about the rates, how many make black holes? And three years ago I would tell you about 1%, and that's probably around that number, but that number would actually be higher right now because even lower mass supernovae could produce black holes. Yes? Yes, sir? Uh, you mentioned that you want to pursue this. This uh, sheet for the Compton uh, Lecture uh, uh, Luncheon says December 12th. So the next lecture will be December 5th? Right. No. Yes. yes. No, December 5th is the physics with the bang. No, no, I think, I'll check, but I think, uh, I think December uh, 5 and December 12 is the last one, according to what they told me, but we'll, we'll figure it out. Because they were advertising that. Yeah. Okay. Which days are cancelled? Which day is which day are cancelled? Huh? The next couple of weeks, sir, there's not going to be. Uh, the, the next week, I think there's a, uh, another event going on, cosmology event. And then the week after, uh, there's Thanksgiving. So. Yes? Uh, you mentioned that some of the structures you've shown are, are so uh, beautifully and clearly defined. But between uh, whatever is at the core, a neutron star or a jet, and the A, a spherical uh, shell, the expanding shell, what is it that you detect in that volume? In between? Yeah. <clears throat> so <clears throat> you basically stars? see the remnant of the star. You see the, in, the, the internal structure of the star that exploded. So you see the only structure. Outside, there's going to be a lot of hydrogen uh, or helium. And as you go deeper into the core, you will see higher, uh, higher mass material. You'll see uh, in the center, you're going to see a lot of iron, nickel, and cobalt. And in between, you will have intermediate mass elements like silicon, sulfur, oxygen, carbon. So that's mainly what you will see in those blobs. Except if you have these jets that happen in some of these explosions that are very evident, that will mix material outwards in a very complicated way. So you will see radioactive material out there, the explosion happened in the center, you'll be like, wait, what, what is this doing there? Well, it was moved there by this uh, jet, this alpha. So that's why we're interested in looking at supernova arenas from a three-dimensional perspective, trying to understand the three-dimensional composition, because then that helps us understand what happened to the star that died, why, why it exploded this way versus this way. Yes? Can you try to find out which supernova explosion led to the Earth's creation? That's a good question. Uh, <laughs> I don't think we can. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Uh, what was that question? Uh, if we can figure out which supernova led uh, to the Earth's creation, or the, the enrichment of the Earth uh, with heavy material. Now, that uh, we believe that this probably happened several uh, you know, billions of years ago before the, the solar system was even there. So if that happened so long ago, you know, our, our, our sun and our solar system is five billion years old, okay? That means that uh, you already had the raw material, which was enriched in silicon and all these uh, elements that we use every day, when the solar system was formed. 
That means it had to happen before five billion years. So if it happened, we're not going to see it. It's so diffuse after five billion years. There's nothing left. Yeah. To it's going to be really hard really because hard. usually what would happen. That's why we call our sun a, a, a second generation star because there had to be a first generation star in our neighborhood that exploded. Uh, producing this. Um, and, and would that have created the sun as well? Or I'm sorry? Would that supernova explosion also create our sun, or is that separate? It wouldn't directly create it, but the, uh, it would enrich. So if you look at those images uh, right here, this explosion happened, it kept expanding and it becoming more and more diffuse. This material, however, after billions of years, it's not gravitationally bound to anything. So you will have uh, regions of the sky, pockets of the sky, of, of, of material that are close enough together to recollapse. Mm -hmm. And recollapse together in the form of nebulae, which is where stars are born, and create the sun and other stars. So. They have to recollapse yeah. later. Yeah, exactly. Yes? The envelopes that we're looking at, most of these uh, images that you're showing, Approximately how many light years across are those? Well, that depends on uh, how uh, how far away the supernova has expanded. Okay. So, <clears throat> if so, the supernova on average, the speed of the supernova on average is 10,000 kilometers per, uh, per second. That's a good estimate, okay? Now, if you take that speed and uh, you use the time scale of 1,000 years, which is more, more, a lot of these events happened more than 1,000 years ago, then you can infer uh, the scale. Uh, so, you know, velocity equals distance divided by time, distance equals velocity times time, and you will figure out that uh, this are, these events are uh, 10 to the 15 to 10 to the 18 uh, centimeters across. Yeah. Pretty large. <laughs> Pretty large. Yeah. You know, they're, they're advertising this on December, they're advertising the physics with the bang on December 5th. Okay. So, could you... You're, are you going to hold your lecture in a different place or something? No, it's going to be. It should be in the big room. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> I think somebody needs to talk to somebody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's lots and lots of people that come to that event. It's so, so it's it's cool. the Frank Institute is who puts it on. But that's their reward. Well, that's what the domain initially. So if that changes, that you know, uh, I don't know. This is I'll get in touch with you. Yeah, okay. yeah, check it out. Yeah. Right. Any other questions? Yes, sir. In those dozen or so supernovas that you had on the on the list, only one of them was out of our galaxy. The other ones are in our galaxy. Supernova 97A yeah. was outside of our galaxy. Oh, Four yeah, of them were But all these supernova remnants that I just showed you, they were in our galaxy. Other questions? Well, thank you very much again.